And we are back again. This is the Horror Guys with episode number 109. Nine. I'm, I'm Oh, I'm who sorry. are you? I'm sorry, you first. You first. <laughs> no, okay. I'm Kevin. And I'm Brian. And we're the Horror Guys. Yeah. We're going to talk some, some horror movies today. Four horror movies and a short. Sounds like a formula we got going there, don't it? I'm seeing a pattern. Yeah, we're going to mess that up before too much longer, but we're good for this time. So we got some movies for you this time. Um, want to howl at the moon with some of these? Howl at the moon with ginger snaps. Yeah, fun little werewolf movie. Uh, but that's not the only werewolf movie. We've also got... Dog Soldiers. Yeah, what, nothing, what's worse than soldiers and dogs? Well, dog, dog soldiers. soldiers. <laughs> and then we'll just stay home and have a quiet evening with the, the babysitter. babysitter. Where are we going to have that quiet evening? In the house that dripped blood. Ooh, that just sounds tasty. Hill. No, not Haunted Hill. <laughs> not Haunted Hill. <laughs> the house that dropped... The house that the dripped, house that dripped blood, blood on Haunted yes. Hill. Yeah. No, we got Haunted Hill a couple weeks ago. We got another Haunted Hill coming up before too long. But no Haunted Hills this week. Just the housing that dripped blood. Okay. Which didn't actually drop blood. No, it didn't. No. Missed opportunity there. Well, you want to talk about that one first?Ure, it's the oldest. 1971's The House That Drips Blood Anthology. Directed by Peter Duffel, written by Robert Block and a few other people. Stars Jane Bryans, John Bennett, Denholm Elliott, and of course it's got Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing and... Uh, and Doctor Who. John Pertwee, yes. It's got Doctor Who. <laughs> Doctor, any movie with a Doctor Who one, in it one of good. his spinoffs <laughs> and it runs one hour 42 minutes link in the show notes if you haven't seen this one and you really should what do you yeah, think you should I thought it was a lot of fun yeah, yeah. three yeah. three main stories and a little bit of a wrap around yeah, and they were all really good yeah and a lot of big names in it and yeah yeah the very casting in, of this one was surprising yeah uh huh well the wrap around story involves Inspector Holloway from Scotland Yard who's been put in charge of chasing this temperamental film star who has vanished. The sergeant explains that this isn't the first time they've had trouble at that house. Then he goes into the story. Tells the stories, and that's where the stories are. Yeah. And the first story is called Method for Murder. Charles and Alice Hillier rented the house after it had been empty for some time. Charles browses the library and finds an old book called The House of Death. Alice hates this house but Charles is impressed with the library. It is a nice library. I've never bought a house that had books already in it. Yeah, well, it's a rental. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. Uh-huh. It comes fully equipped. Charles is a writer of murder and horror stories. Dominic, one of his characters, is an escaped maniac and the centerpiece of Charles's stories. He's just a figment of Charles's imagination, but he seems real to the writer. Mm-hmm. Dominic really takes over the book, and Charles can... He can identify with him. Soon, Charles starts seeing Dominic around the house and on the grounds. That's the first step of a problem. It is a problem. But there's more to it than that. Charles goes to see a psychiatrist about these visions. The psychiatrist doesn't seem so sure that he can help Charles. He sees Dominic strangling Alice, but she says it was Charles that was doing it. During their next session, Dominic strangles the doctor. How Oops. does that happen <laughs> if he's not real? <laughs> Dominic then sneaks up on Alice back at the house, and they embrace each other. Uh-oh. What? It's really her boyfriend, Richard, in disguise, trying to drive Charles mad. Pretty darn good job of it. The police find the doctor and Charles's dead bodies. Whoa, whoa, wait, that wasn't the plan. Wait, who's the crazy one here? And then the guy says, his name isn't Richard, it's, it's Dominic. Dominic. Who's real? Who's not? Yes. Which takes us to our next story called Waxworks. Philip Grayson, an unmarried retired businessman, rents the house after those people are gone. He wanders around town and comes across a wax museum and goes in. One of the statues looks just like the woman Philip used to love, but she's got a man's head on a platter. You. The proprietor comes in and explains that she was modeled on his own dead wife. The man tells a creepy story about how she was both a murderer and a victim. That night, Grayson tears up the photo of the woman and goes back to the wax museum where the statue now has a skeleton face. He's just really dreaming, but oh, there's a knock at his door. It's his friend Neville, who finds the torn photo in the trash. 
Neville wants to see the wax museum as well, so they go in. He recognizes the, the wax girl as well, and then they go home. Grayson goes back to the museum and finds Neville there, staring at that face. They both felt like it was really Salome standing there, and they both think there's something evil about the place. Neville wants to go back, but Grayson tells him don't do it. Grayson goes back to the museum and finds Neville's head on the girl's platter. Evil. Oops. Evil. He tried to warn him. He did? The police sergeant claims there's something about that house. So then the detective goes to see Mr. Stoker, the realtor for the house. And he believes that Mr. Stoker believes the house is cursed. And he leads us into the third story called Sweets to the Sweet. John Reed and his daughter Jane move into the house. Jane's afraid of fire. Reed hires Mrs. Norton, a nanny, for his daughter as he doesn't believe in boarding schools. Jane is a weird kid, and Mrs. Norton picks up on the fire fear very quickly. Jane explains that her father is very strict. He won't let her have friends or toys. Jane soon gets over her fear of fire, and she sees shapes in the fire. Norton wants to take Jane to the local playground, but her father won't hear of it. He won't explain why. He does allow her to buy Jane some toys, and she gets Jane a doll. John throws a fit and throws the doll into the fire. He insists that that's necessary. He found out what his wife's Jane's mother really was, and that he was glad when she died. That night, Jane comes downstairs and gets a book off the shelf. The next day, she explains that yew trees used to be evil magic trees. What's this kid reading? What does this kid know about? Jane hides the book from Mrs. Norton, but she finds it anyway, and it's a book on witchcraft. Mrs. Norton confronts Mr. Reed about Jane. She thinks he's afraid of Jane. And uh, he is. For good reason. (laughs) The power goes out, and he can't find any candles. When he does find the box, some of the candles are missing. He slaps Jane for stealing them, and she runs off. Later the next day, Jane has a fully constructed voodoo doll, and she starts hurting her father with it. Those darn kids. Mm -hmm. Well, she's a natural witch. Yeah. Yeah. Reed explains that Jane is evil, just like her mother. He knows what Jane has done and tells Norton to find the doll. Mrs. Norton chases Jane around the house until Jane finally throws the doll into the fire. Oopsies. Cue the screaming upstairs. Ah! And the final story is called The Cloak. Paul Henderson is a flamboyant actor. He wanted to rent the house, but Mr. Stoker didn't think he'd be very happy there. He and his wife move in. Stoker warns them that the previous tenants have had some, um, tragedies. Yeah, there's well, there's a history here. <laughs> Boy, does it. Paul is an expert on monsters because he usually stars in horror films. Carla says he'd feel more at home in a medieval castle than in a modern house. He whines on set and goes on and on about present-day horror films having no, having no real pizzazz. Pizzazz, no real, yeah. No real horror anymore. Yeah, there's no horror in these things. Yeah. He hates the fake-looking cloak they give him, so he insists on getting one himself. A real one, as a, a matter real of cloak. fact. Yes. Yeah. So he go. Someone leaves him a card for a, a costumer. Paul goes there and asks for a vampire's cloak. And the creepy old man has exactly what he needs. He puts on the cloak and can't see himself in the mirror. He gets out on set and the cameras start rolling. He puts on the cloak and bites his co-star right on camera. Takes a little carried away. A little too much in character. That night he puts it on again at midnight and he grows actual fangs and floats around the room. He realizes the cloak is cursed. He invites his co-star Carla over to the house the next evening, and he reads about the costumer shop burning down and realizes what happened. You know, I've read the word online, Mm -hmm. customer, misspelled costumer, so many times I'm trying to mentally correct this as I read it. (laughs) Customer. Now, it really is a costumer, (laughs) not a customer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But uh, Carla talks him into putting on the cloak. So he puts it on right at the stroke of twelve. Nothing happens. Turns out she switched cloaks as a prank. Psych. She puts on his cloak. Turns out, though, she was already a vampire, and she explains that they'll all love his film so much that they want him to join the club. She then bites and turns him. 
All right, so back to the wraparound story. Holloway and Stoker continue to talk about the house, and Holloway takes the keys and goes back to the house. He lets himself in and starts looking around. He finds his way into the basement, where he finds Paul Henderson sleeping in a coffin. Paul wakes up, and we see that he's a full vampire now. Mr. Stoker places a fresh to let sign in the front yard. Perhaps you will like it. There's nothing to be afraid of if you're the right sort of person. Think it over, he explains to the camera. All right. The house only taps into what you already are. Uses that against you. If you're a good person, you wouldn't have a problem there. I don't know. Um, um. <laughs> the old man who was a retired businessman and got stuck with that wax thing, he was a nice guy. Well, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, the father of the, yeah. the witch daughter, he was kind of a jerk, but mm. he was right. Yeah. 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 It's just an evil house. Yeah, just an evil house. Yeah. So the funny thing is, though, the house that dripped blood has not a single drop of blood shown on screen. It does not drip blood at There's all. There is no blood here. For such a what, apparently a low-budget film, it has a very impressive cast. None of the stories are bad, although the fourth is a little bit silly. Vincent Price wanted to be in this, but he couldn't for contractual reasons. Peter Cushing wanted out, but couldn't get out for the same reasons. Contracts. Vincent Price wanted to do it and couldn't. (laughs) Peter Cushing said, oh, hell no, but he had to anyway. Uh (laughs) None of the stories are too long or too short, and none of them are boring. The acting is good, and the sets and lighting are appropriate, and it is one of the better anthologies for the time period. Mm -hmm. A little silly at points, but it's good. Yeah. Very entertaining. All right. Then we bump all the way up to 2002, a movie from this century, and we see Dog Story. Now, Dog, dog Soldiers. Story. Dog Soldiers. Well, I yeah. bunch of Dog Story. Uh-huh. It's all right. 2002's Dog Soldiers, directed and written by Neil Marshall, stars Sean Pertwee, the son of the vampire in the previous movie, mm-hmm. Kevin McKidd, who I haven't seen in much other than Rome, and Emma Cleesby, an hour and 45 minutes. And lots of other recognizable faces, too. Yeah, most of which weren't that big in 2002, but I've gotten there. Mm-hmm. Did you like it? Yeah, yeah, I did. Very entertaining. Yeah, yeah. this is yeah. really a very different kind of werewolf movie. Yes. Yeah, the house is More. under siege, and it's they're smart werewolves. They're not just animals. More of the predator style of horror movie, you know. Oh, yeah, werewolves yeah. as predator. yeah. Well, you fit these guys up with infrared cameras and you're doomed. Well, they, of they can see they, in the dark as it is. They can see in the dark, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, a young couple is camping in Scotland and they whine about the mosquitoes. Is that a thing? Uh, it's probably a thing. It yes. probably is, yeah. yeah. She gives him a solid <clears throat> silver letter opener, which is an odd gift to give to someone when you're going camping, but he's got a new job. That night, some, something opens their tent and pulls them both out. We don't see it, but from the sound of things, it's probably a werewolf. The letter opener doesn't get used. No, no, no. It's coming. Credits roll. We flash back two hours earlier as soldiers pursue a man through the woods. It's a training exercise, and Captain Ryan orders Cooper to shoot their guard dog. Cooper refuses and fails the test. Now, you were saying something about the guard dog scene? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but... He would have to, he would have some explaining to do because uh, those guard dogs are expensive. Yeah, they are. To, to, to trained trained fully, military dogs are not cheap. Military dog, yeah, you don't just randomly shoot them. Yeah, he might might as well shoot the corporal or something. It'd be just as cheap. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> you know, either would have had to do some serious lion or or some some consequences for that. Yeah. Don't know what happened to that dog. No, never heard. No. This is a rough week for dogs. Yeah. In, the, in this it episode. Is. Oh yeah. We flash back. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, he fails the test. Four weeks later, the soldiers are dropped off in the woods again. Sergeant Wells is in charge this time. They're on a special training mission against special forces. We get a conversation where we learn most of the soldiers' names, and Cooper tells the story of the two campers that were never found. Locals claimed it was an escaped lunatic that killed them. Captain Ryan is leading the other team, watching them with his binoculars. That night, they all sit around telling ghost stories, and it's all fun and games until someone drops a mangled (laughs) cow on their campfire. (laughs) Yeah. What? (laughs) They were camping at the base of a cliff, and a cow jumps. That was startling. Yeah, it was. (laughs) Boom. So we see Captain Ryan watching things with his night vision goggles, but 
something else is watching him. The next morning, the guys investigate where the cow came from, and they discover what's left of the special forces camp. It's a gory mess. Then they lose their blanks and load up with real bullets. Captain Ryan is still alive, but only barely. He's in shock from his wound. He says, There was only supposed to be one. There wasn't just one. One what? Ryan warns them to run for their lives before they get torn apart, too. And they start hearing howling in the distance. Uh oh. Wait a minute, wasn't this in the Ruh-oh. morning? <laughs> wasn't this supposed to be daytime now? No, it's nighttime now. <laughs> They waited for the sun to come up to check out what happened with the cow. Mm. 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 Well, they all run around in panic, and one guy impales himself on a tree. Oops. That's a great soldier. The werewolf gets another, gets another one of the soldiers. Sergeant Wells gets parcel, partially disemboweled, but Cooper rescues him. They keep the wolves at bay with machine gun fire. They flag down a car, and the girl driver, Megan, tells him to hurry up and get in. It's tense, but the car gets away. I heard the gunfire out there earlier. I knew that if you weren't in trouble, you soon would be, Megan explains. They stop at a nearby farmhouse. There's nobody home, but there should be. They search the house, and there's really no one there. The fire in the fireplace and food still cooking on the stove shows that they left in a hurry just recently. And just recently. The pet dog is locked in the closet. Ryan and Wells are seriously injured, but the other four men and Megan are still okay. They discuss leaving for town, but their car has been torn apart. The men fight the werewolf trying to get in the front door, while the pet dog pulls on a piece of Sergeant Wells' intestines. Ew. Well, that just makes things a little more hectic when when the dog's trying to eat you and the werewolves are breaking down the door. Bad dog, bad dog, let go. (laughs) When all that finally calms down, Megan explains about werewolves to the men. They're smart and they're organized, but Cooper still doubts that they're werewolves. Megan has been tracking and watching them for a year, she says. Cooper and Ryan have words, but Ryan won't explain what his mission was. She's like the Jane Goodall of werewolves, then. The wolf whisperer. (laughs) Yeah. Ryan was fatally wounded, but he's looking much better now. His wound is completely gone. Whoops. How did he manage that? Huh, it's contagious. Well, the werewolves outside take out the generator and all the lights go out. The monsters finally make their move, and the bullets start flying. I'm not sure how four soldiers could possibly have that many rounds of ammo, but they do. They do. Yeah. Eventually, eventually yeah. they drive off the wolves. Megan and Cooper talk about the monsters. If they're real, what else is real? You've seen what lives in the shadows. Which is always a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you, if you, if in these it, things, if if one thing is possible, then they all are. Yeah. 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 Where's the werewolves and the other monsters? Huh? Yeah. yeah. yeah if, and the vampires and yeah. If one thing is real, probably more are. Yeah. Well, one of the guys gets outside and hot wires the car in the garage, but unsurprisingly, there's a monster in the back seat. At some point, Sergeant Wells gets out of bed. He's feeling much better now too. Yeah, you know, from having your guts uh, eaten by the dog out in the middle of the street. To and, feeling all yeah, better now. Now he's up and about. Yeah. Well, Megan knows Ryan from his first visit. Ryan explains that he works for the Special Weapons Division, and they were assigned to capture a werewolf and bring it back alive. Didn't work so well for him. No. Wells and his men were expendable. They were just bait. Hearing this, Wells punches Ryan, which causes him to... um change. They all gang up on him, but he bursts through the window and escapes. After seeing Ryan change, they all start watching Wells really closely. (laughs) He knows it's coming himself. Megan explains that there's no way out now. This is really her house, and she's been a werewolf all along. She was just holding it in. Good. They can do that. They can do that. She let the other werewolves in earlier. There's an intense claustrophobic battle which culminates with Wells changing into a werewolf, but as he does, he cuts the gas line and blows up the house. Cooper survives, but then he runs into werewolf Ryan and they fight. Cooper finds the body of an old dead camper along with his silver letter opener. What? The letter opener came back? He stabs Ryan with a silver knife and kills him the end. Never going to see any of them again. No, never ever. Yeah. It's always nice to see a werewolf film set in modern times. 
You always have to wonder how well certain types of monsters would fare against a well-armed military force. And here we get exactly that. All it does is slow them down. <laughs> the werewolves <laughs> win every time. Yeah, it's mighty lucky that there was a silver knife that ended up in the bone room of the wolves. It's even more convenient that Cooper found it and knew what it was. Yes. Well, the acting here is really good, but the accents are a little hard to follow sometimes. But not, not too bad. We had subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> Which helped. Kevin McKidd, Liam Cunningham, and Sean Pertwee all got much bigger roles after this, but were not super well-known prior to the film. The creature effects are good here, but I found the overuse of shaky cam a little annoying. But I do definitely recommend the film. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. What do you think all about the shaky effects. cam? practical effects. Oh, it, it was forgivable. It wasn't that bad, yeah, but I've, I've I always seen, hate the shaky cam. I've sure seen worse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're much worse. But anyway, recommend it. Thumbs Thirsty? Up. You thirsty? For some orange juice? Short film for this week is called Blood Orange from 2021. Written directed by M.P. Wills. Stars Rahel Roman, Matt Levitt, and Sam Glissens. Runtime, 14 minutes, 44 seconds. And there's a link in the show notes to watch it on YouTube for free. What'd you think? Blood yeah, Orange. I thought it was pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A tale of revenge. Yeah, that's, how, that's what it is. Oh, I don't know how much of this I want to give away. I've got the whole thing written out here in my review. Don't don't give it away. Well, the narrator tells us that in the past, a nine-year-old boy kills a bird with a hammer. His friend vows eventual retribution. We see Eli, a blind man who's got a complex orange pulping machine. He goes outside looking for his dog who's gone missing. Meanwhile, somewhere else, we see another man leading the dog out into the woods where he clips off a piece of fur and puts it in his souvenir bag. He then does something terrible to the dog. That night, Eli sits alone and listens to his neighbors fighting and having sex. The next day, he looks for his dog again, and the neighbors are mean to him. And more stuff happens. And stuff happens. <laughs> That's where we're going to stop. Yep, don't give it away. All right, well, a list of Eli's ingredients at the end. You can make your own blood orange... Blend. You can do, you can have the drink <laughs> featured in the movie, mm-hmm. and that's the kind of the perfect finale to the story is having the recipe there. Yes, yes, it was. You hear but do not see the dog suffering, but that's something that bothers a lot of people. So trigger warning definitely goes into this one. Mm-hmm. It's well shot, well written, and well acted, and you're really rooting for Eli here. Uh, we're never told the dog killer's name, but it's clear that Eli knew it was him all along. Yes, yes, yeah. he did. Yeah, that was even relatively painlessly spoiler-free. <laughs> but you should see it. Yeah, it was yeah. good. Which one you want to do next, ginger or babysitter? <clears throat> oh, ginger. Ginger Snaps. Oh, oh, from 2000. So this was a couple years before Dog Soldiers. Directed by John Fawcett, written by Karen Walton, and John Fawcett stars Emily Perkins, Catherine Isabel, Chris Lemchi, Hour 48 Minutes, Link to pick this one up in the show notes if you have not seen it. Boy, I liked this way better than I expected to. Yeah, I thought so too. The Going co- into it, I was ready. The cover, it a it's bit. like, oh, it's girl werewolves. Big deal. Um, there's more to it than that. There's a lot yeah. more to it than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, I, re- it was really good. Very entertaining. Yeah, I like this better than I expected also. Mm-hmm. And I thought I had seen it before, but no, no I sure I, don't remember it. I had not either. No. I keep looking. I, I kept looking. Well, when we were watching, was there some other movie called Ginger Snaps? No. Oh, there, there wasn't. isn't. Uh-uh. Huh. Yeah. Maybe I saw the second one, Ginger Snaps Back, and it Canadian, didn't like it. Canadian film, eh? Yeah. Was it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> All right. So a woman and her son play in the backyard until they find their pet dog totally ripped apart. Yeah. What we have were, we got against we dogs were this week? That's a bad, bad week for dogs. <laughs> she screams as the credits roll. Two sisters, Ginger and Bridget, are talking about death. They like the idea of suicide, but they have this phobia about people watching their dead bodies. Sounds like typical emo goths to me. Kinda. Yeah, a spinoff. Yeah, they stage their own fake grisly deaths and take pictures of the gore for fun and internet points. And for a uh, school project. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> At hockey practice, Bridget falls right into yet another dead dog. It's the beast of Bailey Downs that keeps eating the local dogs. Uh oh. <laughs> they go out that night to set up a practical joke to scare the mean girl at school, 
and end up finding yet another dead dog. While they're out, Ginger starts bleeding. It's three years late getting her periods, but it's finally hit. Out of nowhere, a monster runs in and takes Ginger away. Bridget follows, but only catches up in time to see her viciously mauled by a werewolf. They run away, and the werewolf gets splattered by an oncoming truck. Well, it usually takes silver, but... Silver bullets or road a will big, delay. fast truck. Yep. They get home, and the bleeding is stopped. Actually, Ginger's wounds are already healing. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Bridget runs into Sam at school the next day, and he jokes about hitting a lycanthropy with his truck. Yeah, well, he did. He just <laughs> Yeah, he did. Yeah. Ginger is acting sick all the time, and it's more than just her first period. The wounds are now growing long hairs. Bridget mentions that it's getting a bit on a full moon. Well, you know what happens on a full moon. Ginger doesn't appreciate the idea. They argue a lot, like real sisters. Ginger suddenly gives up the baggy goth clothes and starts dressing like a slut, which annoys Bridget. Sam and Bridget talk about the animal he hit. He really thinks it was a werewolf. Bridget starts counting down the days until the next full moon, and Ginger is literally growing a tail. So it's more of a gradual process for her. All month Uh, this goes uh on. So yeah, yeah, it's not just a full moon thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone can see that Ginger is changing, but it's all attributed to her growing up. Turns out Ginger isn't hungry for sex. She's hungry for meat. She eats the family dog. She has sex with a boy, and it looks like she may have infected him with it like an STD. Whoops. (laughs) She gets a silver navel ring that really, really hurts. Silver. Yeah, yep, bad idea. The next day, she beats up the school bully, and no one notices that she has fangs when she does it. So about this time, you start noticing, I mean, we we saw the tail earlier. Of course, that's all covered up. But Mm -hmm. she walks around, and you can see the fangs in her mouth all the time. And and no one comments. Nobody notices this. Yeah. Yeah. They're little fangs. They get bigger as the month goes on. But if you're paying attention, you can see the differences at this point. Mm -hmm. They tell Sam that Bridget is infected, and he doesn't know that it's really Ginger. Still, no one comments on her pointy teeth. One thing leads to another, and the two sisters kill the school bully in their kitchen. Jason, the boy Ginger infected, is wondering what's going on with his body. He's growing a tail and claws, too. A different kind of puberty. <laughs> but nobody explains it to him. <laughs> well, there's the birds and the bees and the werewolves. Yeah. Finally, Halloween comes, and it's also time for the full moon. Bridget finds some monk's hood, which is something along the lines of Wolfsbane, and she and Sam start working on a cure. Jason attacks her, and she stabs him with a syringe. It seems to work. Hmm. Yeah, and, um, all these years, it's been a problem, <laughs> and a high school kid figures out the cure for werewolfism just like that. Yep, uh-huh, easy. And the right dose and everything. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, Mom starts to get suspicious when she finds a couple of fingers in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that would do it. Yes. <laughs> then Bridget heads back to the high school to confront Ginger, who is a lot worse than she was before. Bridget and Mom have to follow Ginger to the Halloween party at the greenhouse, where Sam and the serum are. And of course, she doesn't even look remotely human at this point, but it's Halloween, Mm -hmm. so nobody really notices. Bridget slices her hand and Ginger's as well. She infects herself with Ginger's blood. They all head home where the cure is. Meanwhile, Ginger's metamorphosis continues to progress. Things go badly for Sam, and the two sisters do battle. <clears throat> and the more end. stuff. Yeah, and stuff happens. There aren't a lot of female werewolf stories out there. The werewolf menstrual cycle metaphor is beaten into the ground with this one, but it is a good parallel. The once a month and the... F- yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, it's my time of the month. <laughs> Most of the fun here is watching the two sisters spiral out of control and try to hide it from everyone. And damage control as they go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the parents are completely oblivious to the point where it's a comedic point to exploit over and over again. In the film, she slowly changes into a werewolf over a period of an entire month, but finally does the big change on the next full moon. It's not a sudden shift like in most films. Jason, the werewolf, felt a little rushed, but there was never any explanation of where the first werewolf came from or what happened to its body if it was actually dead. 
at an hour and 48 minutes, I thought this started to feel a little too long toward the end. Mostly just before Halloween night, I thought it was getting a little little slow. But then Halloween night saved it. Yeah. I'm not immediately sure what I would have cut out, but something might have been shortened somewhere in there. It's a strange combination of not enough coverage for some parts and too much for others, but still, I did really like it. Yep, yep, <clears throat> see it. You should see it. You'd like it. So, in the full moon, you go out and have some good time as a werewolf. Who's going to take care of the kids while you're doing that? The babysitter will take care of them. Yeah, we go back to 2017 and watch The Babysitter, directed by Mick G. Written by Brian Duffield. Stars Judah Lewis, Samara Weaving, Robbie Amell. One hour, 25 minutes. What'd you think? I liked it. It was good. It was fun. Totally serious. I believe every bit of this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is definitely a, a comedy level horror film, but yeah, a little but, suspension of disbelief like, is going to be needed. Awfully, awfully comedic, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Cole is a nerdy kid, afraid of everything, and he's friends with Melanie, whose father's a jerk. Some kids start to bully Cole, and B runs them off. B is his babysitter. Cole's parents are going away for the weekend, or the night, or something. I'm not quite sure on this one. I, I'm sure they said going for the weekend. For the weekend, yeah. yeah but they, yeah, there, there's issues with that. Yeah, there's 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 issues. There's issues. <laughs> yes, yeah. we'll get to those. <laughs> and Melanie talks Cole into staying up late to see what his babysitter does after he's supposed to be asleep. Yeah, what did your babysitter do when she was asleep? When you were asleep? I don't know. I was asleep. Yeah. Cole and B have a good time over the weekend. He stays up past or the night or whatever the heck it is. He stays up past his bedtime as planned to see what happens. The doorbell rings and Coles goes to see what's happening. Could it be an orgy as he's hoping? An orgy? It's not, not an, an orgy. orgy. There are six teenagers playing truth or dare. It soon becomes a kissing game and it's all very sweet and romantic until B drives two daggers into Samuel's skull. Wait, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> Cole watches in shock as they catch Samuel's blood in goblets. Things can get messy when you make a deal with a devil. And this is a messy, messy movie. Oh, yeah, Yeah. very messy. Yeah. Well, then they open up a big book of devil's verses, and B mentions going upstairs and getting the blood of the innocent. Cole immediately calls 911. They all sneak into Cole's room and draw blood with a syringe while he pretends to be asleep. Cole passes out from the needle. He doesn't like needles. He wakes up tied to a chair. B explains that all of this was for a science project. The cops arrive and things go badly with what Kevin calls cartoon physics. Mm Mm-hmm. Very much so. Yeah, there's a lot of gore and screaming. Two cops and two teenagers are soon dead in the juiciest manner possible. It's very juicy. Cole escapes, but rather than run to the police or another house, he decides to grab some fireworks and crawl under the crawl space, planning a Home Alone-style counterattack. And at this point in the movie, let me just point out that this is a neighborhood. It's a kind of suburban. A standard suburban neighborhood, yes. You know, there's houses across the street and houses diagonal and on each side. And we see these houses. We're not and just assuming. there's all this noise and commotion and the police car in the middle of the night. Nobody ever comes out. None of the neighbors. Nobody ever comes out to check or look or anything. A lot of noise, a lot of commotion. Yeah. Anyway. Well, Sonya yeah. comes in after him with a knife, but he gets but he gets her sealed in with a like a mouse trap and some fireworks. And takes the, care of her. You know, and then you know, fireworks and explosions and Oh yeah, like the nobody, whole bottom of the house explodes. Nobody notices this yeah. in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. And of course there's a police car in the front yard with the flasher still going and yeah. nobody comes over nobody to see why it's been there for why. so long. Oh, yeah. One of the teens, Max, catches Cole but releases him to go fight the school bully who is egging Cole's house right at the, this very moment. So the bully kicks Cole's ass and leaves. Cole runs and hides in his treehouse with Max right behind him. Max climbs up and soon Max is hanging from his ne- from his neck dead. Whoops. Oops. Yeah, more cartoon physics. Yes. This leaves only B B to deal with. Cole runs to Melanie's house, but do they call 911? 911? No! No, just try to go and hide. B wanders around the house with a shotgun while while the two kids hide. Cole runs back to his own house and finds several of the dead bodies, 
including the cheerleader who isn't as dead as he thought. Cole grabs B's devil book thing and threatens to burn it. B explains about mixing the blood of the innocent with the blood of the sacrifice, and then you get everything you want. B offers to partner up with Cole, and it would be just the two of them against the world. He burns the book and runs away. Cole then starts up a car, drives really fast, and drops the car through the house on top of the babysitter. Yeah, I totally believe all this is real. Again, cartoon physics. Cole crawls out of the car just in time to watch B die. Finally, more police show up. Hmm. Yep, very real. Very, very, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, the first 20 minutes is for getting to know the situation and the characters, but I kept wanting something to happen. (laughs) When things finally did start happening, they moved very quickly and nonstop. Yes, that's true. There sure is a lot of explosions and screaming outside in this regular suburban neighborhood. No neighbors hear any of this? No one wonders why the police car is outside all this time? Where did the police car go when the bully was egging the house? Oh, they, they, they were trying to cover it up. That, what about Max mentioned. screaming through the neighborhood while chasing Cole? Well, what that. about all the gunshots? <laughs> yeah. It does have a few funny <laughs> moments and surprises, but I think this may have been written for 12-year-olds. Hmm. If you're a little you older than Cole, you'll like it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it was, I, it was I have a question though. about the time yeah. frames. Yeah, it was a long night. It was a long <laughs> night, yeah. <laughs> well, the babysitter gets there like at 7 or 8 <clears> at <throat> night, and the parents are going away. You can see that they're sitting in a motel room somewhere, so they're going mm-hmm. out for the whole night. Yeah. I thought they said for the whole weekend. And at one point, you see uh, B and Cole in the swimming pool in the broad daylight. Mm-hmm. When did that happen? After she got there that evening or the next day? Yeah. Because the whole point of him staying up late that very first night was to see what she did after he went to bed. Right. Mm. I think it was a gratuitous shot of her in a swimsuit is the whole point of that scene. No, they wouldn't do that. Because there's no gratuitous? logic to no. when that could have happened. There was nothing gratuitous in this. No, no, no not, at not at all. All right. So, the, yeah, that's like five thumbs up. I didn't hate any of them. I didn't hate them. No. A lot of dead dogs in this episode. Yeah, <laughs> Several doggies. dogs were killed in the making of this podcast. Poor doggies. Arf, arf. Well, get ready for next week where we'll be watching some more classics. What, what will we see? A boatload of regret with the first one. Werewolves mm-hmm. on Wheels from 1971. It seemed like a good idea. You remembered it being better than that, didn't you? I remembered you? it being better than it was this time oh, around. God, it wasn't. <laughs> And then we've got several films that we saw at the Horror Hound Film Festival. Mm -hmm. Which was a lot of fun this year. It was. Three days of solid stuff to watch. And it was virtual. It was online we could watch. That was the best part. We didn't have to travel. When you go to these things, you've got to try to scribble some notes in the margin and then write a review afterwards because you can't have your computer open in that. Here we could have our computers open. I got full synopses and reviews of like 30 shorts and a dozen movies. Yeah, Yeah. all sorts of things. Well, the first one is the big award winner from the 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 show is called Catherine's Lullaby from 2021. Then we got a weird kind of zombie ghost story thing called Companion from 2021. Another werewolf movie, As the Village Sleeps from, amazingly enough, 2021. 2021. And Dwellers, a sort of Blair Witch kind of thing, also from 2021. And we'll take a short film, Inferno, from 2021 that isn't wasn't from the horror hound it's just a weekly thing we're gonna do right so yeah we got a bunch of good stuff coming next week and you're kevin and you're brian and we're the horror guys and we'll see you next time next week yeah see ya